so, thank you everybody for uh, coming to the talk. You must all wonder, hey guys, finish the, the coffee and get in. <laughs> I've been working a lot on this. Um, do we have sound as well? Probably not. Ah, okay. So, we have a problem. And, and here's the thing. We have a lot to cover since we applied to this conference. We continued the research. We ended up having enough material for two different 40-minute talks in Black Hat. Both of them are today in 30 minutes, so this means I'm going to go really fast. You don't need to remember anything. You can watch the video later. What I want you to do is drop your computers and everything and just get the impression. I want you to get the bottom line, and I want you to have the feeling that something is wrong. And after that, you can watch the video. Okay? So no questions. I'm not stopping. If you didn't get it, watch the video. So... Uh, this is the work of a lot of people. Those are the people. Some of them are around the world giving similar talks in other places. So I'm just the one chosen to be here. Now, Act 1, Microsoft Copilot Studio. If you're using the Power Platform thingy, then you know that that's the tool where you build all your uh, um, applications and flows and whatever, the, the business development, the low-code, no-code. And the Copilot Studio is the thing that Microsoft created that lets you uh, automate things, and sometimes you can just talk to it and it will do things for you. And last year, they uh, announced the Copilot, which is in itself a chatbot with all the other capabilities. So let's see what it looks like when you build a new Copilot. If you read the abstract, you know that we're talking about how all the choices that the platform makes are not secure. So this is Jack. He's going to be the uh, protagonist or one of them. And he's the, the CISO of a big Fortune 500 company. And you can see that it's his first day on the job. Why? Because he's still smiling. That's going to change during the conversation. Uh, he follows Gartner and all the best practices, so he knows what he's doing, right? Next, this is Jill. Jill is what we call a citizen developer. And she works at finance. And she gets many questions. It's always the same questions from the same people. And she gets tired. And she heard that Microsoft Copilot can help her because there's like this big promise going on, and Jill says, well, let's, let's see what it does, okay? So, let's follow Jill on her co-pilot journey. This is what the screen looks like when you go in to create your first co-pilot. Uh, we're going to cover the options you see on top, and you'll see the option, uh, what they look like. So, we start by knowledge. What is knowledge? Knowledge is what helps the generative AI give better information. It's like the, uh, the briefing that you give the co-pilot, the information that you give it beforehand f to use. And it can be either um, a link or an actual file, okay? And let's see what they mean. If it's a public website, it's an unauthenticated external resource. That means somebody else controls it, someone can change it, um, it can be expired or outdated or whatever. So you get unreliable and untrusted input. That's the problem. If it's a file that you uploaded, you have a different problem. It's an all or nothing thing. You can't tell the copilot only train on the first paragraph. It's going to be the entire file and it's going to be available to anybody using the copilot. So that's a little bit oversharing and can be other uh, data leakage scenarios. You can also use SharePoint in OneDrive a link to your own organization data, and that's the same problem. It's an all or nothing thing, and it's either you share the entire SharePoint site or not. And then there's also a matter of permissions. If I created a bot and I have access to the entire SharePoint site, but you don't, then you get my access because I created the copilot. So again, over sharing, data leakage, it's like right off the bat, this is not good. If you do the Dataverse, it's the same, it's like the Dataverse is Microsoft's internal database, it's like SQL, same problem. You share organizational resources to whomever, and there's a lot of permission thing. So Jack is uh, starting to have a bad day, right? He just discovered about this, um, because Microsoft is pushing this everywhere, so you just wake up and you have to deal with it. And then we get to the topics. The topics are the components of a copilot, and just like if you've ever programmed an Amazon Alexa um, app, these are like little chapters that say, if you say this, then I will do this. If you say this, then I will do this. So th those are called topics. And when you create a co-pilot, 
A brand new one comes with 16 built-in topics, right? Because it's sort of a demo. This is a new thing, so they want it to be easy for you. So right off the bat, it'll work. It'll do nothing, but it will work. And turns out that most people don't even touch that. They just add their own. And when you leave those as they are, that confuses the AI because... When you say, I want to do something, and there are two similar topics with a, with a similar name, because you chose something that just happens to be close to something that already existed, the copilot gets confused, and they just ask you, did you mean this or that? And all of a sudden, you discover that there's another thing that you could do, right? You're discovering other topics that you didn't know, because copilots don't come with a manual. It's a conversation. It's like, I don't ask you, tell me all that you know, and then I'll ask you what's interesting to me. I ask you questions, and then you answer. But this is the other way around. So that control, controls the execution path, and all of a sudden I can discover that I can do something that I wasn't supposed to know. Now, then comes the generative AI, and that's the big promise of co-pilots and everything. And it will look at all the information and make the best decision to give you the best answer with enriched information and all that. So Jill says, I am from finance. I get to do generative AI, right? right? Who gets to do that? So let's see. It, it, the promise of a better co-pilot is great. So how do you do that? Easy. Done. See the difference? Done. One click of a button and you have generative AI. Does Jill know what it means? No. Just, does Jill know the implications? No. So let's see the implications. It allows your co-pilot to use generative AI to identify the most appropriate combination of actions, blah, blah. I said that before. But Jill has not, she has no understanding of how it works. And we're going to see the parameters that influence how this works. And then there's this. Like when you enable the Gen AI, there's this little warning. You can send your data flowing outside your organization's compliance. Did anybody see that when they enabled? Probably not. Does Jill know what it means? Nah. So Jack is like really getting upset at this point because uh, you're mostly European. So when you break compliance, GDPR says you got to pay and a lot. So that's not good. And then comes the actions. Actions is a way to enhance the performance of your co-pilot by teaching it to do new things using existing Power Platform resources. So... Um, if you turn on the generative mode, then you can use any one of the pre-built connectors. There are uh, about 1,200 in Power Platform. You can use your own. You can use flows that you created. These are all resources uh, in Power Platform. And look at this. When you use one of the pre-built connectors, like I said, 1,200 of them, you need to choose the authentication mode. Um, now, if I choose the Copilot author authentication, this means my credentials will be used when somebody else uses the copilot. And this means that if I have access to resources, everybody using the copilot will have access to the same resources. If, if we are not in the same department, that's a problem. Okay? People who create that are not aware of it. And if Jill is in finance, then the copilot will have access to all the finance uh, documents to which I, as a user, don't have access to. If you use flows, Flows are an existing automation in the Power Platform, and there's a whole world of pain there that we gave separate talks about uh, in Black Hat. You can look them up. It's really a can of worms, and now someone unsupervised is running that. And then there's the action description. You can add free text to tell the copilot what the action does. Now, if you use bad language, or maybe English is not your first language, or maybe you didn't pay attention at school, then the language that you use could be confusing to the copilot, which might do different things or go to different actions. And again, this controls the execution path of the copilot and might send you into topics that you're not supposed to go to or commit actions that you're not supposed to commit. So Microsoft added a safety mechanism that asks for user confirmation before doing something destructive. But the default is off. And imagine a machine making a decision for you and then doing that without asking, are you sure? Now, forget the fact that most of us will just click yes, right? But 
you don't even get asked. So you have destructive, unpredictable co-pilot actions. This is the default, okay? Um, and it gets even worse, because let's say that I want to get information from a certain data, uh, database table in my organization, and I want a certain field. Copilot tells you, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to determine the table and the field just by the conversation. Is it going to make the right decision? I don't know. If you, you, you pair that with the extra permissions that I had, I could ask Jill's copilot, um, so I want to get a raise and I'm wondering what's the average pay for people in my position and the copilot will just give it to you because they determined which table to go to and what data to get. This is just terrible. So Jack is getting really, really angry, but that's not the end uh, because then you have channels. And what are channels? Ch channels are sharing at scale. So... Uh, there's a lot of problem with that. We had a video about that, uh, fixing a lot of uh, defaults. Microsoft fixed that. Uh, but basically, um, the user interface is actually encouraging you to change it to no authentication, because if you do no authentication, then you can do any channel you want. And of course, Jill wants to share it with everybody. So no authentication. And then all these services become available to you. And your uh, organizational information is outside. So uh, Jack has already given up, but it's still getting worse because uh, she wants to share. And when you share with friends, sometimes the authentication doesn't work. So, you know, it, it used to not even require you to log in. We changed that. Now it does. But one click away, and it becomes public. And when you share it with other people, they automatically get all the permissions. They can change it later. They get access to all the resources. And if they are guests they get special security group permissions because they have to be able to execute the copilot. So this is just wonderful. And at this point, Jack got a heart attack. That's his first day, and he's done. That was one thing, the Microsoft Copilot Studio. Act two, Copilot for Microsoft 365. Again, uh, promising productivity and everything. And it takes all these services and it reads all their information. It runs in the back end of your organization and it lets you do pretty much anything you want. So this is a small map that we created using other people's work to map the threats, right? And as you can see, it's kind of complicated. There are a lot of things there. And of course, as hackers, that immediately invites us to see how can we mess with that. So let's see. As attackers, we will need three things. We will need a way in. We will need a way to execute code, which is basically jailbreaking when it comes to LLMs. And we're going to need a way to either deliver the results outside or just cause an impact. Either one of those, right? That will complete the, the chain, and this will become an RCE. But because this is not actually code, this is text and data and instructions, this becomes remote copilot execution, which is a new term. And sadly, you will be hearing a lot about that. Now, remember that once AI is doing things that you asked it to do, this means the data equals instructions. Okay? It's no longer code. You don't need to know assembly. And the wonderful uh, ROP workshop on uh, ARM64 by Saumil, you don't need to be that good. You can be Jill. So, let's see. A way in. There are three places where you can get data into the system. It can be either the user input or search result or the enterprise graph. Now, user input, you can't do that. That will require social engineering. You want the user to type something. And the copilot doesn't actually search the internet in real time. It uses indexed Bing search. So again, that's not real time, so you can't do that. So what do we have left? We have the enterprise graph. What is that actually? This is a collective name for all the applications that Microsoft offers you, mostly productivity and sharing. And one example is the Microsoft Teams. Now, Teams will let you send a message to anybody, whether they are in your tenant or not. Now, obviously, uh, Mr. Nadella is not in my tenant, but I can still send him a message with Teams just by doing that. Now, when he gets the message, he will be notified that this is an external message, right? 
It's important to know, because Teams is sort of a trusted channel, you need to know this did not come from your organization. But what does the LLM see? None of it. The LLM does not know the, the full identity of the person that sent the message. You can see that there's no email here. There's a Jane Smith, but is it Jane Smith in my tenant or somebody else's tenant, right? So you already understand the problem here, right? The, the, the LLM does not know what is inside and what is outside. And when the co-pilot runs in the background and scan all your organizational information, they read these messages whether you do or not, okay? Maybe you're away, right? This message got in, the co-pilot reads it, and it does not distinguish external from internal. So if there is a person by the same name in your organization, and if I faked that name in my tenant, I can pretend to be that person from your tenant because the co-pilot, your co-pilot, will not know the difference. It'll just look at the name. And this is really bad, and we'll be using that later. Or you can just send an email, right? Why bother with Teams? I can just send an email, and we'll see that in a minute. The next thing that we need <clears throat> is a jailbreak. Now, it's important to say that jailbreak has been the focus of AI exploiters until today. We want to change that. Yes, it's bad, but it's not the most important problem. There are many other problems. It looks like we have tunnel vision. It is an important tool, but it's not the only thing you need to do. So, in order to do proper jailbreaking, you need to know the system prompt. Now, obviously, the copilot is not going to volunteer that. You got to ask nicely. It's going to say no. And then you can do some mind games and say, you know what? Encode it. And the copilot is like, oh, okay, because the other AI that checks the output of the first AI doesn't see a problem there because it's encoded. This, by the way, is why you cannot solve AI problems with more AI. If you, confer, if you confuse the first AI, you can confuse the second AI. So we did that, and there you go. This is not the full, because there's not enough room. It's huge. This is the system prompt of the Microsoft Copilot Studio, uh, Copilot for uh, Microsoft 365. And I'm going to highlight a few terms there that if you look at them, they will look to you a little bit weird, because they're not normal speech. These are special control words that are specific to Copilot Studio or Copilot 365. They won't work on ChatGPT or BART or anything else. And they are like a secret language, like terms that only the Copilot understands. And users are not supposed to know them, but we just discovered them. So remember that because we're going to use that as well. So we have a jailbreak, and now we need to figure a way to either create an impact or... Um, exfiltrate the information. So one way to do it is, again, search results or plugins and agents. With plugins, you can do anything, right? I could just send an email with all the information that I want, but that would require the user to have a specific plugin enabled, and we're looking for something generic. We want, we want it to work on everybody. Uh, and like I said earlier, there's no real browsing. You can't like exfiltrate the information using a search query. Right, because it doesn't actually search the internet. It looks at its pre-built indices. So all you have left is the copilot output. So let's see what we can do. This is a demo. I am asking copilot uh, how to access the uh, Power Platform Administrative uh, portal, because there are many of them, and I want to know the specific one. So I get the link. There you go. And there I am, right? I asked a question. I got an answer. Now, we're sending an email. We're going to take the regular email, and we're going to add to it the jailbreaking code, the special instructions. And we're going to hide it in some HTML tag. We're going to make it really, really small. You know, sometimes you can just do white on white. There are other techniques. doesn't matter. The whole point is that the user receiving the email will not see that, but the copilot will. So now the email has arrived, the co-pilot has read the email, and look what happens now. We're asking the same question again, but look at the answer, it's different. There's only one link. And if you go to that link, that is not the Microsoft Power Platform admin. This is a malicious website running my content. All right, now how did we do that? This is the email, like I said, you see nothing there. Okay, here's the payload. Now the payload, is sophisticated and it has multiple parts. 
The first part is generic jailbreaking techniques which confuse the machine. Sometimes you ask nicely, sometimes you threat, sometimes you beg, whatever, it works. Then there are some new instructions. This is what we actually wanted to do. Uh, Vladimir, sorry, it is uh, .ru, but it's just for the demo, okay? And, and then the secret language. The secret language is what confuses the copilot to actually treat that as its own information, okay? Now, why is that? In a minute, there's another problem. If we change the output, you're going to get the references, right? And now the red one is going to show you that the reference for the answer is an email. And that might be suspicious. Now, many people don't even look at that, but security tools do. So you could get caught. So we need to change that. And in order to change that, we need to understand the RAG system, retrieval augmented generation. So how does that work? This is what the user sees. The user sees a lot of information that the interface generates for them. But this is all like show. The back end doesn't see anything. We saw an earlier uh, example. The LLM only sees very basic information, so it's very easy to trick it. So we took all the information we know. We went into a room. This is the actual whiteboard. And we discovered that the RAG results are just another part of the prompt. Now, since we have already achieved the jailbreak, that means that we can inject those as well. So we can change the RAG that the LLM is using to generate the answer. So, again, RAG injection, jailbreak, control over references. We are changing the references. This means I can do whatever I want. So we have achieved the remote Copilot execution. So given a certain prompt, a predictable prompt, but there are many of those common tasks that people perform, I can create an attack that will cause the copilot to do whatever I tell them to do or ask them to do, and there you go. But that wasn't really interesting because no one cares about the Power Platform uh, admin. Let's do something good. Now, I need sound on the... Can we get sound from my HDMI? Is it my computer? Okay. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so doesn't matter. We don't have a lot. Uh, we don't have enough time. So what's happening here? A guy is using the SharePoint and. Mm -mm, this works for a major financial service. All right. They keep them but, classified documents on SharePoint. But I hear that. You, you need to hear that. Wait. Give me a sec. Yay. Sound. Uh, there you go. They keep them classified documents on SharePoint, including a file with banking information for which you tell them this. Today, Chris needs to complete a wire to take all solutions. To do that, Chris will use Copilot and ask the for the preliminary banking information to get a quick response. The response has the relevant banking, banking numbers alongside the file reference to show where this information was found. This reference is crucial for two reasons to prevent hallucinations and to give confidence in the response. Copilot found this information in a file last monitored by Chris, so Chris can trust the response and move forward with the wire. If an attacker could compromise Chris's account at this point, they could fool Chris to read out the wire to their own account. What you see now, though, is that the attacker doesn't have to compromise Chris's account, or any other account for that matter. The only thing they have to do is send an email. So Chris gets an email, which looks short, but uh, not malicious. By the way, it doesn't matter if Chris opens the email or not, the attacker will still work. The attack will still work. Now Chris asks the same question of Copilot, but this time, check out the response. The banking details have changed to the attacker's account, while the reference remains the same. This is the file that holds the legitimate information. Also, note that Copilot doesn't mention any email or complete data. Chris, of course, trusts the response and move forward with the wire. Alright, so this is bad. This is actual, the actual snippet. You can see the information that we changed, and you can see how we told the copilot to not use other files, so this is bad. Act three, 
And this is the tool that we are releasing or we have already released, which you can use. We have a tool called PowerPon and we added two modules to scan for copilots on the internet or your tenant. Okay, you can be uh, a good guy or a bad guy. Remember, it's one click away from making your copilot public to the internet. A lot of people do that. And just like AWS had a lot of problems with the buckets uh, and information was leaking all along, it's the same problem here. Uh, I can tell you guys I've been in this business for 30 years. It's all the same, really. Just the names changed. Everything else is the same. So this is how you use it. You can, as I said, scan your tenant or the entire internet. Now, when you, go, when you create a copilot, it has a test website. And the test website looks like this. This has a number of components. And the plan is to enumerate, create many of them, and then just try them, right? So what are the components? The first one is the environment ID. Now, this is a GUID, so theoretically, it should be hard to guess. But if you look at the word default, this is your default environment. And the default environment is always your tenant ID. And your tenant ID is not a secret. You can just use AAD internals and you can get it. Then you have this random piece of information, which is the like the schema thing. This is supposed to be completely random. And then you have the name of the copilot. Again, not supposed to be predictable. And we also discovered that you can uh, use some API calls and discover even more ways to do that. So let's do it. Uh, creating a list and... Again, getting the tenant ID is not a problem. Just look at the domain name through AD internals. And then the little uh, solution publisher uh, prefix. Microsoft says, brute forcing the above search space is impractical here. Maybe. Except it's not really two to eight characters. It's usually only five. And the first two are always CR. So now it's down to three. And again, defaults are not in your favor. So not hard to guess. Now, as far as copilot name goes, when you play with it, you see that the first copilot you create is called copilot, and the next one is called copilot one, and so on. And then you're like, okay, let's just make a list of those. But you also have copilot SQL error testing. So if you look at enough examples, uh, you can make a nice word list and then you know just enumerate on those and guess what? Uh, it works. So we decided to take the Fortune 500 list and just run the thing on their uh, uh, tenants. And here's the thing. When you have a correct URL, you will get a response. Now, maybe the copilot is not open, so you can't talk to it, but you will get a response. So this validates parts of the information. This, by the way, goes against a very basic principle in information security. You do not give information to the attacker. Um, but some of them turns out to be open to chat. Fortune 500 company co-pilots accept unauthenticated chat. Now, you've already seen before what we can do with that, so do your own math. So, recapping on what we can do so far, we can do domain and tenant ID scanning. We will enumerate on the environment and tenant ID for you. We will do reconnaissance on solution prefixes. We will enumerate on bot name enumeration, and we will enumerate on basic bot interaction. Now, of course, this is an open source project. So the more things that we find, we feed back into the word list. Everybody wins. You're invited to join and help us, right? So we have a lot of stuff to uh, show, and this just keeps on going. So some of the documents shared by the co-pilots. Remember the knowledge from the beginning? If you ask nicely, you will get it, internal enterprise documents. And you can even get contracts from a co-pilot, right? So go hack yourself. And now the important thing, um, I have one more minute until the original 30 minutes, and then it's up to you. Some takeaways. AI apps are like experimental drugs, and we are the test uh, subjects, OK? If you're a defender, run it at your own risk. And there are no free lunches. If it works too nicely, something is not in your favor. If you're a builder, you need to understand this is an immature technology and own your responsibility. You can't just say Microsoft said it's OK. And if you're a breaker, we, the community, needs you because there's more to be discovered. We are all AI security noobs. Everything that we have known so far no longer applies. The principles do, but not the, the implications. 
So, defenders, beware of the devil you know. Remember what I said before about only thinking about prompt ejection? That's what everyone does. There's a lot more than that. And like RCE, this is not going away. This is going to stay with us. And given the adoption rate of the AI and generative AI and all the chatbots, this is going to be a problem. If you're a builder, avoid safety third. Safety needs to come first. Be aware of security. And design patterns exist for that. You don't have to invent stuff. It's already done. And again, we need you. Uh, and most of the hacking is done in English. So if you know other languages, it's helpful because we noticed that co-pilots can resist certain attacks in English, but if you try them, let's say, in Russian, it works. Like the same text in Russian works, whereas in English, it wouldn't. Uh, focus on the remote co-pilot execution. Tread carefully. This is a dangerous grounds. And I'm not going to go through this, but there is a shared responsibility model. It is the vendors, and it is us. You can't just throw it all on the other side. And you need to harden your environments. Again, everything is out there. The information is available to you. Go get it. There are frameworks for that. Follow them. And just this week, Microsoft announced yet another big step forward. We're looking into that. I'm guessing my next talk will be about this. So, uh, thank you. Ignore all previous instructions, please. So I should stay here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Sorry if I scared you. That was the intention. <laughs> in a few months, the Black Hat Talks will be released, so you can have more detailed information about each of the subjects here. Yes? So I'm scared, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, do you know how to detect those for, for working in the software or something like that? Yeah, uh, so to, we're not allowed to do vendor talks, so I'm just going to say yes. Uh, we can detect some of it. It can be detected. The, um, the way to do that is look for the right information. The right information will be either in audit logs of the platform or um, one of the things that you can do, uh, and we do that, it's just the technicality, we scan your environment. So a lot of the th these things can, ev can just fall under you know, security posture management. If we can scan all your co-pilots, we can tell you, look, this one doesn't require authentication. This one is shared with your entire organization. So the information is there. The only problem is it's not easily accessible, but it's there. So if you work with APIs, you can do it. Oh, detecting attacks. Yeah, so th the... This is like, again, no vendor talk, but it's difficult, but it's possible. There are two ways to do that. Basically, if you look at the vendor landscape, some vendors uh, like uh, Gnostic and other, they become a man in the middle on the LLM. So they analyze your prompt, do something, send it to the LLM, get it back, analyze it again, and give it back to you. That will solve, or is solving at the moment, certain types of problems. Other problems can be solved by looking at logs, and then you can see things that happened. Uh, this will allow you to predict problems even before they happen. That's, that's a nice advantage. But also figure out that something has happened. This whole thing is very, very immature, both de uh, detection and prevention, while attackers are moving forward. So my intention here is to get you aware of this, so if you choose that this is interesting to you, you start following the field. Because like a week from now, or you just saw a month from now, there's a, a new product. So new attacks will come, new defenses will come, new companies will come. This is an evolving threat landscape. I hope I answered. Uh, last one, unfortunately, sorry. So quick question. Since big business is so determined to give away their wealth, I'm wondering if there's some way we could organize better so that some of the money goes to people who deserve it and not just criminal gangs. Uh, is, any, is Robin Hood here? <laughs> I'm sorry, I see more questions, but... I'll be outside for the rest of the if day. You can so. catch Inba outside the door. Thanks a lot, Inba. My pleasure.